19, verse 11. Where you have it, say amen. We stand up to read the word of the Lord. Revelation. 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 Chapter 19, verse 11. We're going to be reading all the way to 16. When you have it, say amen. And we stand up to hear the word of the Lord. Amen. Let me know where amen to know that I you have it. How many amens today? Here we go. One more time. Revelation chapter 19, verse 11 says this. This is John speaking again. Just like Daniel, we spoke in the book of Daniel. Daniel saw something. And now this is John seeing. It says in verse 11, Now I saw heavens open, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness, he judges and makes war. His eyes were like flame of fire, and in his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on the white on white horses. Now out of his mouth a sharp sword, that with it he shall strike the nations, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fear, look at this, fearness and wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of of lords you extend your hands towards me bow down your hand and pray for me in this moment father god i pray father god i pray that the fear of the lord may fall upon the people today because the fear of the lord is the beginning of all wisdom so father god through the holy spirit and right now father i ask you in the name of jesus to take hold of any mind and every heart that have been far away from god that have been playing you, that have been not listening to you, Father. For I know that your word says that the heavens will open up and you will come riding a horse. So today, may the fear of the Lord may fall upon every person who's under the sound of my voice. Father, that they may understand that the times are getting closer. Father, use me as a vessel for you to speak your word with power to your people. Let them understand that you're coming to get your church anytime soon. In Jesus' name I pray. And everybody said, and everybody said, you may be seated. Today, church, as I was praying, and I hope that you are ready to receive what the word of God wants to do in your life. Today is the last preaching of the three parts about Jesus. We have been talking about the duality of who Jesus is. We talked about the two personas, the divine and the human, combined in one body. So I hope that today as we finish I pray in my mind again that the fear of the Lord may fall upon you. I hope that you listen to what the word of the Lord is saying. Because so far, we have gone to the Old Testament to see if who Jesus was, is. We also went to the Gospels 
And we read what the Lord did while he was walking here on this earth. How many say amen? But today I'm coming to you to speak to you about something that is going to happen. Something that the Lord begins to say, and I hope that he puts on your spirit, wake up church, because he is coming soon. We sing songs of he is worthy to open the scroll. He, the devil has fallen. Nobody can pray. He is worthy. But church, I want you to understand something. While you're singing these songs, you do not understand what you're saying. Because if you begin to understand that he is worthy to open the scroll, I need you to understand that the scroll that he is opening is not rainbows or butterflies. It's not mercy and beautifulness. It's not love and mercy. It's judgment. It's wrath. It is not full of mercy. It is not full of love. So as you sing this song, he is worthy to open the scroll. He's the only one. You are declaring and you are wanting for the king of kings to open the scroll and pass judgment on you. Because we think about how God is going to pass judgment on earth and judge the earth. But you are in earth. The king, seated at the throne, he is worthy to open the scroll. But when he opened the scroll, it's not something easy. There's seven of them. Oh, open up the scroll. Who can come against you? And the words are true. No one can come against the kingdom of God. Not you, not your thoughts, not your will. Not your emotions, not whatever you plan to do with your life can stop the will of God. Either you are part in him, either you go to do his will, or you're outside his will. Either or his will be done. You will not be able to church, and I hope you listen to me today. You are not going to be able to ever change the mind of Christ of his will. You will never be able to say, Lord, but can you do my dreams? But can you do my goals? No, the Lord has come for a reason. It is not to make you rich. It is not to make you popular. It is not to make you feel comfortable. The Lord of lords, the King of kings, has come for one thing only. When he comes back, it's to judge the earth. It's to pass judgment. Some of us think that we're, we're Christians. We deserve to live like kings on earth. But today I come to show you a sign that everybody wants to see but are not ready for it. Do you hear me, church? Let us begin with a recap. Genesis 1-1 in the first preaching I taught you that God, Jesus himself, sat at the throne. Is this on? I'm going to sit again. I don't know if you get feedback. He was seated in the heavenly rounds. Genesis 1 1 said, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Again, my God lives outside of time. Nothing can change him. Nothing can affect him. Nothing can make it. He is seated next to the Father in all the glory. Man falls. Everything came from him and it's for him. He created the heavens. He created the earth. He created a tree. He created mankind. And everything gives glory to the one who created and everything has a small reflection of who he is. But nothing that he creates is exempt. Sin calls for everything to be completely just twisted apart. 
So Jesus himself had two things. Now I want you to listen to me because this is very important to the preaching today. My almighty God, Jesus himself, had two options. I am righteous. I am all powerful. I existed before the heavens existed. I don't need anything. I'm in all power and almighty. Everything is subjected to me because I'm the creator. He had two things. Either I wipe you out because I don't need you. I'm a righteous judge. I can't live with sin. He could have wiped the earth clean and be good with it. But in his mercy and in his love, I want you to listen and I hope you're writing down. In the mercies and love of God, he decided that instead of punishing you, he was going to go after you. Are you paying attention to me, church? The almighty, powerful, righteous judge, the one who created, could have wiped everything clean, but he decided, listen to me, in the mercy and in his love that I am coming to go down to them. So the Bible says that he completely left. He stood down. This is where we were last Sunday. He made himself less. So the Almighty, remember last preaching, the Almighty, the powerful God, clothed himself in a skin. Everybody remembers? He left the throne of heaven. He left outside of being next to the creator. He left the praises. He left the glory. He left heaven. He came down to earth to sit and walk among you. Now, people didn't recognize him because the inside was the almighty God. No one had seen them. Nobody knew that the one that created them was among them because all they could see was the flesh, the raggedy old flesh of man. So he had two dualities, two natures. He had the God and he had the man. And he walked the earth. And he was hungry. And he cried. And he learned. And he grew. And he did the will of the Father. He subjected himself to the will of the Father. Not my will, let your will be done. So no longer Jesus could act on his own accord. He said, whatever my Father does, I do. He said, whatever he... He teaches me, I do it. He subjected himself. When he was equal in authority, they were all powerful. He said, I make myself less so he could be exalted. I don't do anything but what my father wants to do. He was crucifying the flesh. He was going, he was teaching us that we can live a godly life if we go against our flesh and follow the will of the father. Are you following me? And he walked the earth, and he made signs and wonders, and he taught about the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is like a man who had a field. That when he found a treasure hidden, he went out and bought the whole land. The kingdom of God is like a man who sowed a seed and it fell in fertile ground. He began to teach about God. He began to teach about his kingdom. When he was at the end of it, he went to be judged before Pilate. He said, if you're a king, where your kingdom is? He said, my kingdom is not from this earth. My kingdom is not here. He understood where he come from. He understood who he was. Let's go speed up a little bit. At the end, he was betrayed. At the end, he told the Son of Man. Remember the Son of Man. Daniel chapter 7. He was relating, letting the people know, I am the Son of Man. That person that David saw before the Father and that all kingdom and authority was given to him, that's me. Jesus called himself the Son of Man. Nobody calls him that. He called himself that. The angel Gabriel told to Mary, 
he will be called the son of God. And when he confronted Peter and all the disciples, what do the people say that I am? Some people say Elijah. Some people say some prophet. Peter said, you are Christ, the son of God. The prophecy is fulfilled that he will be called the son of God. Jesus said on Peter, this has not been revealed to you by flesh and blood, but my Father that is in heaven. Speed up to the Last Supper. Jesus is about to live. He arrested him, got in front of Pilate, and then he carries the cross. He carries the cross. And that reminds me, I don't know about you, about John the Baptist yelling, here comes the Lamb of God who takes away our sin. While everybody was spitting and everybody was yelling, all the angels, I believe, were yelling, here comes the Lamb of God who takes away all sin. His flesh is becoming sin for us. He who knew no sin became sin. The God inside cannot sin. He cannot be corrupted. Don't ever everybody say that God can tempt me because God cannot tempt or God can't be tempted. The inside God is perfect. The inside God cannot be corrupted. He is full of this flesh. Do you follow me? The God inside had all the strength. The God inside had all the power. But all this flesh, all this, this, this temptation was wrapped and it wouldn't allow him to fail. The God inside will not allow the flesh to take over. So he's going out to Calvary. He's going out to the cross. He's going out to die for all mankind. Now this is where people trip up. This is where people have a confusion. And I need you to understand what I'm about to tell you, church. God did not die at the cross. Do you hear me? Say amen if you hear me. You're too quiet. God did not die at the cross because die, God cannot die. He's eternal. He existed before time. You remember that? You wrote that down. He existed before anything could happen so the inside man cannot die. So who died at the cross? Who died at the cross. If the inside man is all God, immortal, cannot, who died at the cross? I'm going to show you what happened at the cross. At the cross, the flesh was crucified. At the cross, The flesh was crucified. He carried your sins in his flesh. He was nailed at the cross. The flesh was put in there. The flesh was whipped. The flesh was punished. He received all the punishment. The, the flesh became sin. Remember, even though you don't see me, he's underneath here. The God is here. But the flesh was becoming everything that you fell to be. For all have fallen short through the grace of God. Everything hurt. Everything went to his skin, his body. He knew no sin to become sin. And it's not that he was a sinner. He became sin. Do you understand the words that I'm trying to tell you, church? He became sin. And it was punished at the cross. That was buried. This shell of emptiness was taken down at the cross. They carried his body. They found a tomb that wasn't even his.
Once they found a tomb, they laid him. The bloodied up, the punched, the scarred, put him to go in a grave and close her down. Not you, not me know what happens when he was inside. We don't know. But I know that on the third day, on the third day when they opened up the tomb and they saw that nothing was there, where was the body? Where is the body? When Jesus comes back to them, he tells them, do not touch me. I haven't gone to the Father yet. He, is, he, he has received a new body. Skip down and he says, I'm going to leave you. I'll leave you with this command. Go. Make disciples of all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. He ascends to the clouds and we don't see him no more. Are you following me so far, church? Okay. Before I begin, did the recap, before I begin to the preaching, I want to follow you a small thing. Listen, listen to me. Because when they, he came to earth, when he had that flesh, people did not recognize him. Because the Messiah was supposed to come and be a conqueror. They were expecting a king to come and set us free from the oppression of the Roman Empire. I'm expecting an all-powerful God. But they came and they got a servant. You hear me? They didn't get what they wanted. They had a servant. They had someone full of mercy. They had someone full of compassion. They had someone who cried. They had someone who healed. They had someone who was hungry and who was, you know, he felt sad. He felt joy and he felt anger. But he had a servant full of mercy. But I'm going to tell you something, church. Revelation chapter 19, verse 11, we see a different Jesus. The Bible says that John saw in the heavens when he opened up. He didn't see a servant. He didn't see someone who was weak and hungry and who cried. He saw a king dressed in a robe dipped in blood. There is no one in heaven that is dressed with clothes dipped in blood. For the Bible says that everyone who came after him were all dressed in white and fine linen. Chapter 19, he says that when he comes, he comes to make war. This is a different Jesus. This is a Jesus who's coming to judge. This is a Jesus who's now no longer giving you the time to make a choice. This is King Jesus. This is the Jesus that when the heavens open up and he comes and people will see him up in the clouds and he will call his people. He will bring his people up. He will take his church and he will close down the heaven. This is the Jesus that if he opens up the heaven and you're not ready, this is the Jesus that will leave you behind. This is the Jesus that is no longer, I'm going to cry because I'm leaving you behind. This is the Jesus that said, I gave you time. 
See, people expected King Jesus to come at first, but you weren't ready for King Jesus because when King Jesus comes, there's no longer I bendito, but God forgive me, but Lord this, but Lord you understand. No, when King Jesus comes, you should have already made your decision to follow me or you stay. I'm no longer going to hear the excuses of I didn't have this or my emotions this or I was depressed. Do you think that King Jesus is going to come into heaven and sit down next to the people and say, please tell me your story. Like the man at the well who was saying, I've been 35 years and no one can help me. No one can put me. Do you think that King Jesus of Revelation chapter 19, verse 11 through 15, is the Jesus who sits down and tell me, tell me your story of why you're not healed and you're not following me. No, the Jesus of Revelation 19 is going to say, those who follow me, come up. Those who follow me, come up. And those who are not, you stay. So keep playing, church. The Bible says that when the Son of Man comes and the time comes that the rapture comes in, people will be getting married. People will be working. One will be taken. The other one was left. People will be sleeping. One will be taken. The other will be left. Are you the one who's going to be left behind because you're still playing church? Oh, I want you to stand at the throne of Jesus of judgment and explain to him the reasons why you couldn't come to church. Please. Kneel down and beg for mercy. Because he is full of mercy since the beginning of time. That's what he came down for. That's why he looked for you. That's why he died for you. That's why he gave you a decision to follow him or not. But King Jesus of chapter 19 of Revelation, verse 11 to 15, is a Jesus who doesn't play games. That Jesus sitting at the throne is praying for you to get your act together. Because when the Father says, go, he is not going to come full of mercy and love. You don't know, you, you don't believe me? Let me read you again. Revelation chapter 19, verse 11 through 16. John says, now I saw the heavens open. And behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him was faithful and true. And righteousness, he judges and makes what? War. Come on, read with me. I need you to wake up, church. Verse 11, he says at the end, true is faithful and true. And in righteousness, he judges and he makes war. What is he coming when he opens up the heaven? He comes to judge you and make war. Where is the peaceful Jesus? Peace. I live on to you. Not that the world gives you peace, but my peace. There's no peace. He says he comes to judge and make war. He comes to judge those who have not followed him. He comes to judge those who keep playing around with the church. I'm here to make judgment and war. That's King Jesus. John keeps talking about him in verse 12. His eyes were like flame of fire. The intensity of who Jesus is. There's no longer those little pictures that you see Jesus with blue eyes and oh my God, the love that he has. He, no, no, no. He is saying that his eyes were like fire that penetrates you. Full of wrath of God, of judgment. This is a different Jesus. He said on his head he wears many crowns. Because he's king over all. No one goes above him. He had a name written that no one knows except him. He was clothed 
in a robe dipped in blood. Y'all looked at me and said, y'all dressed crazy. But when you see someone coming in a horse dipped in blood, you know that he was the one who spilled blood for you. He spilled his old blood to cover you or renew you. No one in heaven is allowed to wear the color dipped in blood because no one is worthy but him to break the seal because he was the one who gave his life at the cross for you. This is a different Jesus. His name is called the Word of God. John refers back to his gospel where he says, In the beginning there was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He's saying, you remember that at the beginning when the earth was created? He was the Word, and he was back then. And the one is coming is again the one that I saw. He is the Word. He is God. He is coming in the clouds. And he says that the armies of heaven, clothed in white linen, white and clean, follow him. Church, I want you to understand that you sit here reading and listen to me. But if I see the heavens open up and armies and legions of horses and people standing with swords and with breastplates, and I see someone with the eyes that reflect fire dipped in blood and crowned, I wouldn't be happy. I wouldn't be in joy because what's coming is judgment. There is no, please, Jesus, take me with you. Please, Jesus. There is no longer that. There's judgment. I hope you're listening to me because this is a different Jesus. It keeps saying in verse 15, now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword. That with it he shall strike the nations. Nobody can withstand the word of God. He is striking. It's no longer bandaging. It's no longer healing the sick. He is striking the nations. He is precise. I'm coming against disobedience. I'm coming against people who don't fall onto me. I'm coming against people who have not recognized me as their king. I'm striking them. is not the same loving Jesus. He keeps saying, and he himself will rule them with an iron rod. You know what an iron rod is? How stiff, how hard. No mercy. He will rule them with an iron rod. There's no longer I benditos, there's no longer I'm giving you a chance. With an iron rod. You were just singing about this Jesus in devotional. Quien podrá, quien podrá, y no ha prevalecido. I got you sure you know what you're singing about? Él es digno de desatar los sellos. ¿Quién podrá contra? Are you sure you know what you're talking about? Are you sure of your salvation that you're okay? That if Jesus comes, you leave? Church, you better wake up and stop playing. Keep singing. Like words mean nothing, because when he comes, an iron rod. Tell me how you worship me and you went home and smoked weed. Tell me how you worship me and yet you open your little uh, phone and watch pornography. Tell me of how many times I'm supposed to give you uh, 
more and more time for you to get yourself together. Please allow me and explain to me how I should forgive you of all the stuff that you have done. Please explain to me how you call yourself a son and a daughter of God and you behave like some woman who does not know me, who dress sexually and dresses like I don't see how you dress. Please explain to me how you're a daughter of God. Please explain to me how you are a man of God and the words that come out of your mouth is like the words of a man who does not know me. Please explain to me how many times that my mercy and my loving kindness will cover you is an iron clod, iron rod. This is what it is. I'm King Jesus. Church, I pray that the fear of the Lord falls upon you because not many people preach that the Lord is coming soon. And the Lord that is coming is not the same Jesus that came to earth. Either you fall in line or you fall out of line. But it's no longer plain because the Lord has warned us through the prophet. He kept on saying, I send you prophet. I send you my word. You still have my word. The word of God said, I wish you were hot or you were cold. But because you're both, I will speak to you out. And you dismiss that verse. I said, it's going to be okay. But I want you to look at your life right now. I want you to look at your spiritual life. Are you hot or are you cold? Because you're both. You're singing about the mercies of God and you are worthy and you're coming home to do what? King Jesus. And all his power of his glory. He keeps on saying on verse 15, he says, He himself tres, treads the winepress with fierceness and wrath of the Almighty. He is stomping with fierceness and the wrath of God. Who can stop the wrath of God? Church, I hope, I'm praying for you to wake up this morning. And in his robe, the name that is written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. I pray today that you may understand that the times are getting shorter and shorter and shorter. King Jesus is coming back for his church. It's coming back soon. And we're playing church. We still have individuals that don't even know their identity in Christ. We still have people who still in a depression. Who still have people that sit at home because of my emotion. Because of how I feel. Because of how people treat me. Because of how the sky is today. Because it's dark. Because it's raining. You have time to play. Because you are in what theologians say. You are in the grace period. You are in that grace. That grace will cover you but there will be one time where the heavens open up and grace will not be a factor because you are either part of the church or you get left behind I pray for your souls and I pray for you to wake up because the king of king is coming And I'm going to repeat it to you one more time. The Bible says very clearly in the gospel that some will be getting married and he will come and one will go and one will stay. What does that mean? People will ignore and just keep doing what they've always been doing because we don't know because they've always said it. Keep sleeping, church. 
Keep your spirit sleeping in a condition that is going to be okay. Keep being on forgiveness. Keep holding on to grudges. Keep not be able to be stuck. Keep that path and see that if the heavens open up, what excuse you're going to give to God. It's the year of here and now. I remember telling my wife at the beginning of last year, I said, I have no mercy anymore for excuses. I want you to hear me. I have no more remorse. I have no more patience for excuses of why I'm not serving God. We have no excuse to offer up God because he will give you no excuse to give him or why you didn't do what God has called you to do. Are you hearing me, church? So I sat down with my wife. I told her, I said, I'm not going to say excuses anymore. I'm not going to hear excuses. It's time to work in the house of God. It's time to expand the kingdom of God. I'm done with the emotions. I'm done with the I bendito. Fix your marriage now, not later. Now, fix your life now, not later. Now, fix your spiritual walk now, not later. Now, because you don't know when the day will come, when the trumpet will sound. You think I'm being harsh and people get mad at me. All people get mad at Pastor Mike is being too rough. All they get attitude with me. But I want you to give attitude to Jesus when he comes down and opens up. What are you gonna, are you gonna give him that side eye? Are you giving him the silent treatment? He had iron clawed. Either you're with him or you're against him. He comes to judge and makes war. That's why I say I ain't got no time to play around with church. I don't got time to play around with my spiritual walk because it's either Jesus or anything else. Doesn't matter. You hear me, church. You hear me, church. The amens walk away. I know it's hard, but someone needs to uh, spank you up and be like, it's time for solid food. Stop playing the baby. We're all mature in the walk of God. We're not 15 or 16 year olds. There is a children ministry that needs to be raised up so our next generation can understand who God is. So we need men and women of God who are committed, who are called, who are anointed and separated, who have the wisdom and discernment to be able to impart in the next generation to walk. And yet we have families that stay at home with their kids, with their tablets, letting them be raised and be fooled by the enemy of soul. I rebuke the demonic authorities that have have taken over the over the minds of our kids because we allow them we allow to behave a certain way we allow behaviors to go unchecked we allow people to and then we say and we wonder why our kids are the way that we are i'm telling you i'm praying for parents who full take the responsibility not just as my kids but this is the spiritual life of my kids this is i am he gave it to me as a gift is this my responsibility to lift them up in the walk with God and so they don't grow up with identity issue so they don't grow up without depression so they don't grow up with anxiety so they don't grow up but they grow up in grace and in stature and wisdom in God we need people who stand up to do that to our children to stand up and to pour with all the wisdom and authority listen people who are prepared to say yes God not no God yes God the next generation we need men who stand up to go after the youth that stop giving so many I can't do it my financials I can't do that the youth are being held captive by the world the music the generation the, the, the things that has happened they are being held captive while we sit here and we complain about ourselves 
Where is the authority that these should die for the church? Where is the authority that we have become against it? We have become a whiny little kids. We become bratty kids that we're like, my feelings are hurt, so I'm going to sit this one out. And I'm going to let the ministry do whatever it wants to do. I'm going to let people and souls get, get lost because I decided to sit down because I don't feel like it today. I don't feel like talking to no one. I don't feel like singing. I don't feel like preaching. My mind, Pastor Mike, it's, it's, it's today is bad. I can't do nothing. And the church and the people get lost because you decided to say no. No, because I come first. No, because my feelings come first. No, because I'm hurt. No, because I'm, I'm going after something else today, Pastor Mike. No, 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 Pastor Mike. I can't do it today. Find yourself someone else. I want you to give that excuse to the almighty God to tell him when he says, what did you do with the forgiveness and the salvation that I give you? No, no, no. You don't understand, God. What happened to me is that I didn't have a mom and a dad, and because I have that, this is where I was like this. And God said, get away from me. I never knew you. The word of God says, if you deny me in front of men, I will deny you in front of all the heavenly hosts so I don't know what you're playing that church but my God does not mess you can fool Pastor Mike you can lie to Pastor Mike you can have a Pastor Mike but there is almighty God who sits and watch 24 7 what is he doing what is she doing what is she thinking what is he thinking what is he watching why have I commanded he sits there and prays it and then he turns around and it's all about them you can fool me, but you won't fool him. I don't know about you. You're, I'm not going to grab your hand and take you to heaven when he comes. <laughs> I'm going to let go. Because it's my salvation too. We need leaders who are ready to rise up the next generation of kids, of young people. Who are being bombarded with their identities. I cry at night. I'm sad how the church just sits around and watches how everything just happens. When families have kids and the desire to go to a park instead of coming to the house of the Lord. It hurts me when I see the young people choose friends and youth and the worldly desires instead of coming and bringing up in the house of the Lord. And it hurts when you see the less workers giving uh, absolutely no care about what happens. I care about myself. If that was true, church, you don't know who my God is because I just told you that the Lord himself cares so much that in the beginning he stood up on his throne and he walked down to earth. And he went to every single person to have an opportunity to hear the gospel and to be saved. So he went to you. He said he died for you. He said he, he gave his life for you. He became sin so your sins will be forgiven. And we sit there and we don't care about anybody else. Because I care about myself. The only one that had that excuse is the almighty God. And he gave himself up. For you. You hear me? The one who had all authority, who did not need you, gave himself up for you. I pray for people who wake up in this church to stand up and go after what is true and what is real. 
We need leaders and sons and daughters of God to be able to stand up and know who their identity is. First preaching, I said, his identity is my reflection. I reflect who he is. I reflect his character. I reflect his authority. I've been telling people too many times this whole month, let your yes be yes and let your no be no. If you can't do it, look at me and say, Pastor Mike, I can't do it. But don't tell me. I'm going to tell you yes, and in two days you're going to tell me no. Because the Lord is not with that. He said it himself, do not be double-minded. Don't say you're a Christian and you don't walk like a Christian. Don't say you follow God and you don't act like it. Do you hear me, church? I'm trying to tell you how the strict, how it's going to be. You think the gospel is something for you to play and bend over the rules. Keep sleeping. I'm finish up with this so you may stand up in this moment. We were waiting for the Messiah to come. We were waiting for the one who had an iron rod and will set us free. And we got the servant to come. But the one that is coming now is the King of Kings. 